So joining us now, we're very lucky to have a uh, filmmaker who actually had uh, extraordinary access to the Trump family building up to the election, after the election, through all the Stop the Steal stuff, and all the way up through January 6th. Um, Alex Holder, that documentarian jo and filmmaker, joins us now. And uh, Alex, you've become even more sort of central to the news because you were subpoenaed and testified in front of the January 6th committee. You've also been subpoenaed as part of this uh, investigation that is going on in Georgia into the fake elector scheme there. So um, pretty extraordinary how you've ended up in the middle of this. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So before we um, before we talk about the film and what you've learned from your <laughs> process, you know, your interactions with the uh, the congressional and legal system here, um, let's take a look at the documentary. It's called Unprecedented. I watched it last night. It is uh, very well done. You know, you did have incredible access to the family. It was really something to relive all of those moments. Let's take a look at the trailer. The new revelation is making some members of former President Trump's inner circle nervous. The January 6th House Select Committee is examining the three-part docuseries. Unprecedented. 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 What do you think we'll learn from this new documentary footage? A former President Donald Trump, as well as his oldest children and some of his senior advisors. Has Ivanka Trump responded? Did he express any remorse? Your show, when it goes on, I'll be putting out a statement. Go watch it. It'll be on Discovery. Okay, who knows where it's going to be on, right? So you talk Amazing. to yeah. all the Trump children, you're there at their events, you're there, you know, at January 6th, you got all this incredible footage. I guess my first question was, why do you think that they agreed to do this? Yeah. That's a great question. And also just before, you know, in that trailer where he says, I'm going to put out a statement, he did not put out a statement to <laughs> say, go watch it. He oh, in fact, yeah. he had to I'm put shocked. That, uh, yeah, exactly. Me too, right? Um, I think the reason they agreed to participate was a, f a few factors, and this is just my speculation. One is, is that at the time when I met them, they were convinced that they're going to win the election. Yep. You know, even though the polls were against that, it was the same, the same thing they were saying at the time, uh, you know, in the previous election, which is the polls are wrong and we were going to win and we're going to prove everyone, you know, wrong again. And you know, Don Jr.'s famous line was you know, during the campaign was let's make liberals cry again, which I thought was pretty cruel. But that was sort of their mentality at the time, where they thought they were going to win. So here was a guy that was going to film them actually win the election. Uh, unfortunately, some of them still think they won, but at the time, that was, the, uh, that was the, the premise. And then the second reason, I think, was that I was foreign, and so I didn't really have any skin in the game politically. Mm. So I think that was also a, you know, an important point. And maybe the third was my British charm. Um, but uh, but <laughs> Listen, we're the, we are uh, suckers yeah. for that. There's That's no true. denying it. Especially Trump. <laughs> His mom was British. Remember, he has great reverence for the Queen. So, uh, <laughs> makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Alex, just tell me the general, uh, what did you learn through the course of the documentary, which applies to everything that we have going on right now with the FBI raid, the context in which Trump views both the rules and the stop the steal and so many of the issues that are at the center of you know the subpoenas that you're now kind of drowning in. What was your general impression having dealt with the people around him and with Trump himself at this very critical and pivotal time? You know, I mean, well, one is, is that he was totally not suitable for the role. I mean, it was just very clear. He, you know, he is somebody who believes that you know, everything belongs to him. Everything that he touches is, 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 is brilliant and superb. You know, he's got this unusual, you know, we say ego, but I mean, it's, it's this narcissistic quality where everything that he is, everything that he is surrounded by is just brilliant. And one of the things that's so interesting about Trump, I mean, you were saying before that, you know, you've meant, you know, you, you've interviewed mm -hmm. a few times and you get to see this sort of quality where Trump doesn't actually understand why people don't like him unless yeah. he doesn't like them first, right? Like right. he has this inability to, how could anyone not like me <laughs> ah, the only reason why they don't like me is because I don't like them, right? That's mm. how he's sort of rational. And so, you know, I was in Mar-a-Lago interviewing him for the second time, and this is after January 6th, a couple of months after he left office. And, you know, he walks into the room, and, you know, Mar-a-Lago is actually very beautiful, and the room that we were in was also very beautiful. It's a beautiful chandelier, and, and anyway, the, the last thing that was beautiful in the room was the flooring, okay? So he walks in, and I go, hello, Mr. President, so nice to see you again. And he totally ignores me. And he just says, look at this floor. Isn't this the most beautiful floor you've ever seen? 
And I'm just like, really? Like, I mean, it was the most nondescript yeah. flooring in the world. And so, you know, he comes in, he sits down, and we start the small talk. And I said, yeah, Mr. President, the last time I saw you, we were in the White House. And he says, oh, yes, of course, but this is much more beautiful than the White House. You know, Trump, all he cares about are these, these, these sort of immaterial things that are just so unimportant and doesn't actually understand the, the gravity and, 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 and sort of what he was doing and what he was responsible of and, and what he's doing now by maintaining this insane conspiracy and lie, which is so dangerous. And we saw how dangerous it was and how it played out on January 6th. I mean, he is just, you know, really, I mean, yeah, for, for, honestly, I mean, th there were times where I couldn't really grasp how this man was actually in charge of America for four years. And it is pretty astonishing, frankly. It, and it and obviously with the FBI. Right? It is right. pretty, it is pretty astonishing. Um, talk to me about what it felt like on the ground on January 6th. Did you have any inkling that this could turn violent, that it could turn, you know, sort of catastrophic in the way that it ends up turning. What was the energy like on that day? So, so I did. The, the, the night before, I'd said to Michael, our director of photography, that he's going to get, we were in an elevator going up in the hotel the night before, and I said, you know, he's going to get them all to march on the Capitol tomorrow. And as I said that, we sort of half laughed because just the idea of that is so extraordinary and, and horrific. But after having witnessed not just sort of the rhetoric that was coming out after the election, but even during the campaign, there was this sense of, at the beginning, I was trying to work out, is it just because I'm British and British elections are very different to American elections? And so this is sort of an accepted thing to, to happen in American election campaigns? Or was this something that was sort of you know, beyond the, the line? And it was quite clear that they were going well beyond you know, the line that's acceptable. And so you know, the rhetoric that was coming out during the campaign, and obviously after the election itself, and then Trump's maintenance of this position that the election was stolen. Like, what does anyone expect is going to happen when you tell 75 million people that their vote didn't count? And the person that's saying that isn't the candidate, he's the incumbent president of the United States. And so to me, it was like this was going to be bad and it was going to be very dangerous. So on the day itself, we had a plan that when things did kick off, and I say when because I was really pretty confident that it was going to happen. And the moment for me where it really crystallized was people in the crowd already saying, based on all the build-up for Trump's vote, you know, Giuliani's speech and that lunatic lawyer speaking and, and various others. Um, that, you know, they were already talking about, oh, there's enough of us here. These were people in the crowd saying there's enough of us here to storm the Capitol. So there was already that fervor in the crowd. There was this feeling of like, it was almost like, you know, religious people mm -hmm. praying that actually Trump's ridiculous idea that he could intervene in this ceremonial process, certifying the results, would result in him being able to maintain his position as president. And so there was this very uncomfortable feeling that I felt all the way through that morning. And then uh, when people started moving to the Capitol, I grabbed a lot of Michael's equipment, took it to my car to try and drive closer to the Capitol so that if things got really dangerous, I could you know, extricate him and you know, we could go away. But that part didn't work because it was impossible. I, by the time I got to as close as I could get, my car was surrounded by people. You know, Michael was already in the in the midst of it all. And you know, in the series, you see this tragic moment of one of Trump's own supporters dying on the steps of the Capitol building. And you know, when you think about this, right, this is American citizens being told to go to the Capitol, essentially being incited to, for all intents and purposes, assassinate the vice president of the United States. So by Americans in the American parliament, right, by American people being told to go there by the American president. I mean, it's just absolutely extraordinary and horrific. And, you know, now with all the things that have come out from the January 6th committee, we know that Trump knew exactly what was going on and refused to intervene to try and, and save, you know, the congressman, yeah. uh, the, the people working in the Capitol, obviously the vice president himself. I mean, and then obviously people tragically died. So it was just an extraordinary, horrific moment. And I'll, I'll never forget when we finally 
managed to, to get out. I mean, I remember driving down Pennsylvania Avenue um, and all the way through on the road, you could see DC police all have with their hands on their gun holsters. Wow. Which was just absolutely wild because it was yeah, so dangerous was a, that day. It was a wild time. I, I, yeah, we were both here in this. I remember coming in that morning actually and it was a bad vibe. Our studio was right near the, uh, by the Washington Mall. I felt the same close thing. Close to the, yeah, close to the White House. It was very close, close to the White House. Yeah. I, there was this attention in the air. It was very early in the morning. It, it was, was a weird, AM, very it was weird strange. vibe. It was a very strange. weird vibes. My, my, my main question to you, Alex, is, you know, based on the subpoenas and more to the extent that these Georgia investigations are probably going to be looking at these false elector schemes. What did you claim from your documentary from footage and more that is going to be relevant as those investigations come forward in terms of machinations by the people around Trump, the false elector schemes? And also my real question is to the extent of what did these people believe at the time? I have no question in my mind Trump believes the election was stolen, but like some of the apparatchiks around him, like what was their varying thinking as they were moving forward with these schemes then? So I think there were, there were a few camps that I noticed, right? One is that Trump, certainly towards the end of his administration, surrounded himself by people who just said yes to everything he said. Yep. And he always had the people around him. I mean, one of the things that I always found just totally you know, sort of crazy was really one of his closest aides, who was you know, given the title of director of social media or, or whatever, but really one of, essentially his right-hand man for all intents and purposes, was his former golf caddy. <laughs> and, you know, like, these are the people that are surrounding him. These are the people with access to these, you know, secret documents that he had kept at Mar-a-Lago. And so you had that camp, which were essentially people that were like, yes, sir, three bags full, sir, and they'll do whatever they can to make their boss happy. And they believed everything he said. Then you had another camp for people who really hoped that Trump would pull off his attempted coup, essentially, but were unsure and weren't particularly believing in the madness. And then there were others who sort of saw it as typical Trump, but they didn't really think it was going to work out. And then maybe there was a very few number of people who thought it was a really bad idea and thought he should do something else. And those are the people and the interactions I had with some of those people around him during the making of this. But with respect to you know, Georgia and Trump, I mean, what I, what I saw was... You know, when I interviewed him in the White House, this is about four days after his own attorney general had spoken to Associated Press and made the statement that there was no evidence whatsoever mm -hmm. to support his claims. He is literally sitting in the diplomatic reception room at the White House with the portrait of George Washington, which the $1 bill is based on, looking down at him. And he is undermining democracy in that room, but not just saying... Joe Biden didn't win the election. He is saying sort of the, the very conspiratorial ideas that he'd been saying for you know, all the way through, but then coming up with remedies as to how they should be you know, proven. So for instance, he's saying, we need to find brave judges. So he's mm. now undermining the judicial branch of the American system, which is the, 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 one of the first things you do as a dictator, right? You need to get the judges that agree with you. So we need to find brave judges, he's saying to me. We need to move the decision about reopening the ballots to the Georgia legislature. Why? Because they agree with his position, right? He needs to find a better secretary of state in Georgia who isn't, as he calls, you know, a bonehead, right? And a stupid person. So this is the president of the United States with the man with a nuclear football meters away, and he's undermining democracy in the most profound way in the seat of power of the biggest democracy or one of the most powerful democracies in the world. I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, and yeah. that was I mean, why, uh, that's why I witnessed. One of, the most, one of the most bananas things of the many bananas things that came out during that time was that call that he had with the Georgia Secretary yeah, of State, yeah, right. where he's literally like, I need you to find me 11,870 votes. I mean, that was what you have in the documentary. I'm sure that um, I'm sure that down in Fulton County in Georgia, where they're investigating the the um, fake elector scheme in that state. I'm sure these are some of the very things that they will be very interested in hearing from you, what Trump and the people around him had to say. Um, I really do recommend the documentary to folks to go back and rewatch and remember how all of this went down. There were a lot of big events that I just, you know, I've, I've 
was telling, I forgot how close it was to election day that he got COVID. You dig into some of the family dynamics of, you know, the um, the kids, especially Don Jr. and Ivanka and uh, Eric sort of competing for his affection and how that plays out in some of the dynamics with regards to Stop the Steel con Conspiracy. So I really recommend it to people. It's it's definitely a worthwhile watch. Um, tell folks, Alex, where they can actually find Unprecedented, the documentary. Sure, it's on Discovery Plus. And yeah. if you sign up, you get a one-week free trial. So uh, Well, there you go. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, it's the second Discovery Plus documentarian we've had on the show. So I guess we're happy to support it. We'll have a link down in the description. And we appreciate you joining us, Alex. It was really interesting talking to you. Yeah, great to have you, Alex. As a reminder, premium subscribers out there, vote on whether you would, in order to make sure you get the show on time, we can either degrade the quality, not significantly, but it would degrade it as to what you're used to, or we can send the show out on Vimeo, but it will no longer be on YouTube. I know some people enjoy the comments and all that. We will leave it up to democracy. You that's guys, right. there will be no rigged election. Yeah, that's uh, right. <laughs> it's 48 hours, winner take all. Uh, whoever wins the majority, that will be what we do going forward. Direct so democracy let there. us know. Like we said, newsletter, vote. It's a, it's a Google form that you can go ahead and link. Everybody else, if you want to be a premium subscriber, you see, we take great care to make sure, because you know, this has happened now two or three times. And I'm like, this is just unacceptable. We can't, we can't have people uh, waiting a long time. I know how, so many people build the, their lives yeah, around the well, show. Yeah, well, and part, it's part totally of the promise of you know, the premium subscription yes. is that you, you exactly. get it first, you get it right. before everybody else, Bingo. before the clips post at, right. at noon for, for a general audience. So um, yeah, let us know how we can best make that right. I mean, right. we are sort of subject to the whims of these tech platforms. Yeah, we have There's no control. Only so much that we can do, but these are at least the best options. Right, we, we have no control with. over YouTube processing, but you know we will spend whatever we need to spend on whatever platform or whatever in order to make sure that we fulfill that promise. And if you do want to join us, we would deeply appreciate it. Also, we got the live show tickets, which are on sale. Any other administrative? I think we're good. I think that's it. We'll see y'all tomorrow. Now. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.